We're going to be doing an interview with Walt Pavlo. He was involved in in the MCI WorldCom. It, it was at one of the. This is the largest accounting fraud in U.S. history. U.S. history. Okay, yeah, yeah that's and, still going. Still got the record going. So, so if you watch like documentaries, there's documentaries out there sure. about MCI and WorldCom. Uh, they all, it's always kind of cursory. Like it, it's always kind of a, a brief overview. And there's this where they, they kind of started cooking the books where they were at the, the, I guess the, um, the CPAs or the, uh, the financial officers were asked to start putting money, showing that there was, there weren't losses, that there were actually gains. And they were, they were, they were saying that these are, you know, this is capital, ex, you know, there's this capital and these aren't actual expenses. And they, they were doing right. little things. They never really explain the only person I've ever heard explain, okay, like, how did it get to that point? The only person that ex- ever explains how suddenly uh, this massive losses started showing up, mm-hmm. the only per- uh, they never say, they say, oh, they say, well, these, these losses show up, and then they decide to start cooking the books. But the only person I've, e- I've ever seen explain what those losses were is, is you during your interviews. Because... Mm-hmm. To the average person, you're like, oh, they t- they just took losses. Well, yeah, but there's a reason they took losses. And right. those losses are also fraud. They right. make it seem like people just weren't using the service. But that's really business, not the business case. Business was booming. I mean, I think the big thing about telecom that made it very unique is that the consumer is winning in, in telecommunications. And when the, just like in housing, right. when, when the consumer is doing well, nobody asks a lot of questions. And in telecom, it was the same thing. As services improved... Prices went down. Um, you know, there were different sort of applications that were going on. They were making a ton of money. So there was no regulation. There was very little oversight. Right. And there was just a ton of money. And then what happens, well, though, when well, people stop paying? And that's right. what happened with all the telecom. Okay. Well, so I, that's what kind of what I wanted to go over. But, sure. I mean, obviously, I want to start kind of at the beginning. And, sure. And, which is basically like we're, we're, I don't know if you've watched any of the interviews, but basically like, you know, like where, where were you raised? Well, oh yeah, no, sure. I was uh, I was raised in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and Atlanta, Georgia. And then my dad got transferred quite a bit. I ended up in uh, West Virginia. Went to West Virginia University. Uh, got an undergraduate degree in industrial engineering. Went to work for Goodyear Tire for a few years in their aerospace division, and then uh, went to General Electric Limited of England in their aerospace division. So I, you know, I, I go from like these heavily regulated, heavily audited industries. Um, you know, where there's auditors everywhere, you're filling all these damn forms. And uh, I get a job offer at MCI Telecommunications. And it's like, you know, well, what do you guys do here? It's like, whatever the hell we want. It was right. a wild west. Uh, you know, what experience are you bringing from your organization? Because we need it in ours. And that's basically how I got into MCI. Right. But you, you, and, but you, you, I mean, obviously you were qualified. You had what a master's degree? Have an MBA in finance, oh, MBA, yeah, right. Yeah. And you, you, you were already working with these other big. The, all of these are big companies. Big. So well, a headhunter came to you and said, "It, it was uh, through a it, there, look. There were job, you know, uh, fairs everywhere. But I had a somebody who was the uh, in human resources at MCI, and they asked if you know, hey, if you're looking for a job, this is a great place to work." Okay. So I, you know, I took the opportunity. So what was the, what ended up being the, the position? The job did? was, it was interesting because I, I, you know, I'm, I'm more of an engineer at heart. And, um, as I went to MCI, they said, well, you know, there's all kinds of jobs open here. How about if you take this one? <laughs> and right. I was, and I was like, wow, what's that one? And it was, um, you know, accounts receivable management, which, you know, if you look that up in a textbook is the last job that you'd want to be involved in. You're just collecting yeah, money. Collections, right? Collections. Yeah. So. I'm not a big guy. I'm not going right. to be, well. you know, what, what am I going to do? Like, yeah, hey, you better pay your bill. But it was in the resale division, which made it really interesting to me. I was actually going to be working with every telecom company that was out there. WorldCom was our biggest customer. So AT&T, Sprint, these are customers who bought excess telecommunication services from MCI and resold it under their own their own brand name. It okay. happens today too, Matt. Right. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. if you pick up your cell phone and you call... It doesn't always go over Verizon or Sprint, whatever it is. Right. You know, in the background, it travels over different networks, and then those companies. You know. So you want to ex- explain that? I mean, let, I'll, I'll say what I think. Sure. It is. It's it's basically there's a lot of infrastructure where there's you know whatever over the phone wires and you know 
satellites or whatever. Yep. But let's face it, like AT&T doesn't own all the satellites in their, in their network. So if I call from Florida to California, it has to go through multiple satellites or multiple different phone systems. And those phone systems are rented from or leased. Correct. For, um, or they have an agreement to pass your phone call through. You know, AT- I call through AT&T. Well, it goes through Verizon and then it goes through somebody else. Yep. And then the call ends up being taken by some guy who's with Boost Mobile Correct. or whatever. And they all get billed a fraction and they pay. So what they were doing at MCI is there were, what, phone rooms and stuff? Or, or no, I'm sorry, smaller carriers that were then leasing those same phone lines through MCI and yep. selling what? They were selling like... The prepaid cards, right? They or? could sell. They could sell about anything. I mean, you're 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 right on target on, on what how exactly it works and breaking it down. But there's other people like you know Matthew Cox wants to be in the telecom business, and basically all you would do is buy 100 percent of your your you know the, the, your your backbone from MCI and market it. Matthew Cox, long distance. Right. And so it's like a white label. It's yeah, like, yeah. Exactly. And we encourage that because that group. You know, the, the smaller carriers are the ones where you really made the money. Look, when I'm buying telecom services from, uh, or, you know, AT&T or I'm selling to AT&T or WorldCom, remember, I'm also buying from them at MCI. If I have you on my network, it's a one-way street. You're buying from me and, you know, you you can only use my network and I'm doing everything. So I can charge you whatever you want. I have, I'm not going to be buying any services from, you know, Matthew Cox. So I'm going to mark it up quite a bit. But you better have a very unique service that it is going to generate income, and it's that's a lot where of competition. There was a lot of competition, and you had to you had to have a unique product. And unique products back then were gambling, fortune telling, and pornography. And um, so, small telecom companies that got into those businesses had big margins, and those are the ones that we went after at MCI. So we had all these guys that were like AT and T and Sprint tens of millions of dollars per month that they were you know, billing on our network. WorldCom was $200 million a month. Matthew Cox is an example. Telecom might be 75000 to a $1 million a month, but most all of that is profit. I mean, it's a heavy markup in, in that, that business. So it's an important part of our, our business model. Where do you go get profit? People you're just exchanging dollars with, AT&T and Sprint, or do you go with you know Matthew Cox who's like forking over the money to you? Right. And those are the those are the ones that we went after. But those are, are those and those are the ones that you were collecting on. Like when they would get behind, then you'd come in and say, "Hey." Well, that was that that, that was a thing. When I got into the job, Matt, I'll tell you, I never thought that I'd be collecting money. I mean, um, I thought that I would be negotiating contracts, which is what primarily what I did issuing credits, making sure the billing was good. You know, I mean, I was a service to most of those people, um, you know, those big companies. But when it came to the small guy, I was out of my league. I mean, these these were hustlers in in many ways. And um, they were they could run up bills pretty fast. There's there's one that I that I always talk about. um, They talk about in in my book, Stolen Without a Gun, um, Caribbean Telephone and Telegraph. Now, Caribbean Telephone, as its name implies, it was based out of Detroit, Michigan. Right? right. So, they were they had a calling card, and they had a you know, and it was one eight hundred call whatever country, and they were it was pretty cool. You know, you could call you know Cambodia, Vietnam, Mexico, Jamaica, whatever it was. They had a calling card for it. All right. This and is they, back in the late night. I'm sorry. I just want to like I, I'll get people in the comments and they'll they'll they say like, what in the hell is what that? What the hell are they talking? What's a phone right. call? Like because right. you know, most of these guys are like 20 or 30 years old. Sure. So yeah, it's basically that's that's um, <clears throat> this was back in the late 90s, right? Back in the, this is the big. You know, if when you want to know where telecom originated, why we have the services that we do today, it began in the 90s. Right. And and you know, calling cards were the prelude to all the services, the prelude to the internet. Right. I mean, so you, you need to, if you want to make a call to your mother, your, your mother in Jamaica and you're Jamaican, then you would buy a prepaid calling card yep. and then you would punch the numbers in to the phone and then it would connect you through and it would start taking the money off of the card. Like a debit that's, card. Yeah. That's one way. That's the, the scam that you're talking about. These guys sure. are basically running because it all ends up being almost like it's basically runs up ends up being a scam that those guys are running. Right? Well, it, it, it does because you have a piece of plastic that just got is worth 50 bucks. And, you know, and, and Caribbean Telephone was selling these at a street value of $50. Their underlying usage, you know, that they need to pay MCI might be only $10 or even less. And um, so they're making a good markup on it. We're making a lot of money on it, too. 
But if they don't pay, if they don't pay for the long, you know, the, 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 the usage on that card, they got the 50 bucks. That's 50 bucks. Yeah. It's like you're, you're printing a piece of plastic that costs about a penny. Right. And they're running on our network and you just never pay for it. That's, that's a lot of profit. And that's exactly what they were doing. And they ended up owing us, I don't know, 20, $25 million in unpaid invoices. And, you know, I, it was, if you've ever been to Manhattan, you go to these little bodegas in there. It seems like they got a grocery store in there of anything that you possibly would want to buy. Calling cards made for a hell of a profit margin for the bodega. If you look on there, you got Wrigley Spearmint gum and some shit like on the counter that they can right. do. Or you could put a stack of calling cards there that has a street value about two grand. Right. So it, it doesn't take up very much counter space. So it's a great product for these little bodegas. And that's what they... To get them into those bodegas, what Caribbean Telephone was doing, very unique, they would go out to like guys that were selling bread, cigarettes, milk. They would go to their truck depots. They'd sell them a stack of cards. These guys would in turn sell them on their route to all these little bodegas around. And it was primarily all done in cash. And money came back to this one central office that they would have. They'd count the money, take it to the bank. And when I say money, I mean like this table right here would have a million bucks in cash on it. Right. And... Um, they were just running it. And after a while, that becomes, I mean, cash disappears, yeah. you know, even inside the company. And um, so they weren't paying their bill. And that that became a big problem for us. And, you know, they were they paying? Yeah, but their usage went from like, shit, 50000 bucks a year to about $10 million a year, $10 million a month, I'm sorry, sorry. within a year. So they were they were doing big bucks. And then they, they kept falling further and further behind. Yeah, they pay me $5 million. But so they owe, you, they owe you ten. You come in. They're like you're like you owe ten or eleven million. They give you like five. And correct. You, you keep the you. They give you just enough to keep their scam going for another month or so. And if you're if you're at a company like I was, and uh, your your bad debt budget, the amount that you would write off during a year on a bad year might be ten million dollars. And these dudes are into you for twenty five million. Right. You got to do whatever you can to keep that guy alive because. You can't write off twenty five million, yeah. right? I mean, you're, it's like it's going to ruin my whole year. One customer, so um, you try to keep them alive, and it just kept getting worse. You know, five million. They were, you know, five million more in the hole. Five million more. I mean, really, it was a. I think when it was all said and done, it was over fifty five million dollars before somebody said no more. Th that one cup. That just one, one. Just one. Just and one. So customer. they basically those are like the, the. Then they basically can shut down, open up somewhere else, correct? And start over with with MCI again under another. Use another face, use another corporation, and start the whole process over again. You know, I tell you, that was probably you know they, moving on from Caribbean Telephone, some of the other small, you know, you know Matt, Matthew Cox Enterprises, right? right. Um, Matthew Cox Enterprises would run up a debt of us a you know, million bucks, close down. The same salesperson would call call you up and say, Matthew change your name to MCI <laughs> and right. and just put it in your wife's name and we'll we'll you know use your same equipment and I'll sell you another contract because these salespeople are getting paid commission yeah commission on revenue generated not on money I mean it was an extremely aggressive program go out and find as many Matthew Cox right you know and CTNTs as you can but in the end it's tens of hundreds of millions of dollars hundreds of millions can, of dollars hundreds of millions of dollars of customers that aren't paying us and right. that and that becomes a you know that's that's a bigger problem <laughs> that's you and it's the, 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 so here's the complicating factor where you know things start to go wrong in accounting um i don't want to go too technical in accounting but in accounting you actually don't have to receive the money in order to record the money right so you know, it's the accrual basis of accounting. So this is the way big businesses work. So in January, we have usage of telecommunication services. I then send an invoice out in February. When I send that invoice out, it becomes an asset on your balance sheet. It's called an accounts receivable, money that's going to come in to me. You can record that. Right. You can record it income um, as you know, revenue on your income statement. Even though you haven't received it. Even though you haven't received it. That's the way the accounting works. And then later, you know, when the money doesn't come in, you're supposed to tell everybody, hey, Remember that million dollars or fifty million dollars? But it didn't quite come in, so we're going to take that off of our revenue. Right. Okay. We hadn't done that, and and you know, so on paper, Caribbean Telephone looks like a success. Matthew Cox Enterprises looks like a success. All these different companies look like they're, you know, they're they're very successful. Right. So, what you um, you know, what you have on the books looks really good. You know, it looks it's like it's not re reflective of reality. Well, the reality is, is that you're, you know, uh, uh, judgment day is coming and right. you're going to have to, you know, 
when do you tell people? Right. The other complicating factor that happened, you know, with, with us was um, British Telecommunications announced that they were buying MCI. So we have all this good news on the books, right? And we have a company that's getting ready to buy us, and which eventually got, you know, WorldCom ended up coming in. But it, at the moment, it was British Telecom. The question becomes, when do you tell shareholders that it's not quite working out for you? Right. And, you know, the answer was then that we're, we're not going to tell them. Right. You know, that doesn't make that. How is that going to help me? Our revenue is up. Our profits are up. Um, uh, the, our stock options for people like me are way up. Right. And now I've, we got a potential buyer who's going to take us all out. Right. We're gonna, all our stock options are going to invest. We're going to be millionaires. Right. You know, inside of our company. So, you know, the incentive to keep things try as best as you can to keep this boat together is extremely high. Right. And that's what we did. You know, we, we started we, we started cooking the books. Right. You know, to make it look like this revenue was going to come in different, you know, different sort of shenanigans that we could use. And um, one of what wasn't one of them that they were offsetting some of the losses to to other companies that M- MCI owned so that it would look good on the the balance sheet for the main company but this other company is taking a loss you could you could do stuff it was actually simpler than that man you what you can do is is you let's just say that you is that wrong that wasn't something that's it yeah we we, it it evolved into that it it evolved into that but like if you owed me a million dollars what i might say to you is like matt look i know you can't pay me a million bucks but i i got to get something on the books i'm going to transfer this to a promissory note so you're going to keep using your current usage and I'm going to cut you a break and you're going to like, I'm giving you a loan over the next three years. But look, the first payment's not due for like a year or two. Right. You know, so you, so it really doesn't so it cost like you. it looks like an asset. It looks like I did get the money. Correct. It looks like there was an it, asset. Exactly. Then you can take those assets and you can start moving those around to oh d- other, you know, different companies. But you give the appearance that every, you're going to get this money in when, when in fact, you know that you're not solvent. You couldn't, you couldn't possibly pay that. You may not even be in business. I mean, that's what we ended up doing with Caribbean Telephone. They owed us over $50 million. We said, your first payment's going to be due two years from now. And then we disconnected them. They're out of business. But on the books, they're still an asset. And that's, you know, th- those are like some of the games. In fact, you know what, Matt? It wasn't even, we didn't even call it cooking the books back then. We called it helping. Right. right. You know, can you help? Because we were looking for solutions. And, and at first, we're not, well, we, I, I, we don't I'm know sorry. if we're ripping people off. Right. We just, you know. Just, Can we buy us some time? Yeah, we're all making money. We're just keeping things going. We, Tons we, we of wanna, money coming in. Right. So I, my question is, like, this isn't something that, like, you didn't, you entered the business. You start seeing these things slowly happening. But, I mean, at some point, you have to know, okay, this isn't quite right. Like, I mean, was there somebody who's telling you this is how we're going to do it? And was there a, a moment when you were like, like, Okay, well, this is this is fraud. Or did you think, oh, okay, this is the way it's done? Like I've been in that situation before, where someone was telling me this is how it's done. I was like, oh, okay, and I just kept going and going. And then at some point down the line, I started going, no, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Right, right. You know, that's like I don't know how if, if or at that moment you knew, no, something's wrong, bro. I would that's say no. I, I would say at the moment I was like, well, there's still money coming in the door, right? right. I mean, it's not like. We're not going out of business, so I don't know exactly. But somebody explained to you, we're going to shift this to do this. Mostly or? the way that they explained it back then was, here's your budget, and you need to meet it. And you start meeting with other people just like you that are bright, and you're saying, what the hell are we going to do? Right. Well, you could do this, and you could do that. And you start looking, it's like, well, I don't know what a hell accounting is. I'm, right. I'm not an accountant. I, do I Have I taken accounting courses? Am I smart enough to kind of know how it yeah. works, but do I know all the rules? And at, at, at that point, I didn't want to know any of the rules. Well, even, it, even that rule, even the rule where you're saying, look, I'm, we're owed a million dollars and you're claiming that this is an asset. To me, that doesn't make sense because it's like, yeah, but you don't have the million. You're like, yeah, but we're going to have it. No, you don't know that you're going to have it. But the accounting principle says, no, no, you can claim that as an asset. Correct. As and, income, it, even though you haven't got it. Like even to me, so I can understand saying, I'm not an accountant. Like, I don't know, because the fact is, is some of the rules don't make sense. Right. 
So, but I'm sorry, I'm just trying to no, clarify no, you're that. Exactly, I, I, no, I get you're, what you're saying. You're exactly right. I mean, and, and I think you get caught up in the confusion. It's like, like, well, hell, you know, I'm not an accountant. It, and you, you just explained it well. And I might say, well, you know, he's an accountant. Right. Let's, let's do that. I don't understand all what the rules are. I'm not a CPA. I'm not licensed. Right. But at I'm, some point... At some point, you you're, you're looking and saying, okay, look, you know, now I'm no longer talking to the accountants. I'm just making this shit up on my, my right. own. You know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm an accountant. You know, right. I'm, I just start being as creative as I can and, and uh, making, up, making up payments, making up redating invoices. I mean, you know, whatever it took. And, and basically, all I'm doing is presenting to other executives inside of MCI and even some accounting people are, the numbers are, what you're expecting them to be. They look, they look good. That's You're doing a good job, Walt. So, and, and the, you talk about, you know, nice. how, how do you wake up, uh, you know, and think like you're doing something wrong and then you start to be promoted? You know, now, now it's, it's really confusing because they're like, okay, I know I'm doing all this stuff and it does seem a little off, but I'm, at the same time, I'm being promoted. I'm getting yeah. more stock options. I'm getting bonuses. I mean, and everybody's saying it's okay. Like good, everybody within, good. everybody you're. Sur- that's the big thing when you're surrounded by other people. Like being in prison, being surrounded by like other other criminals, you start behaving in a certain way. Then you get out in regular society, and you start realizing, oh wow, I'm I'm absolutely not behaving the way a typical right. person. <laughs> like 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 I'm not under like everybody's behaving differently now and, and I'm I'm really an oddball like this is really I'm really out there not realizing because because of the environment the situation you were in and I can see being surrounded by people in a in a business and they're all saying no this is okay this is acceptable this is fine but if you were to go outside of that business and explain it to somebody else they'd somebody be like, would wow. say wow what are you what are you into right and I didn't explain it but you know at, at the time MCI was like today would be like working for Amazon. It would be like working for Google. It would be like working for Apple. I mean, it's just like, wow, what do you guys do there? I mean, it's so high tech. It it was a revolutionary company too. Like I've watched a couple documentaries where um, I forget the founder came in and where where it was, um, uh, was it Bell? That owned everything, or was it? Yeah, eight, yeah, eight, eighteen like, to eight. Yeah, the, the they owned bells. everything. Th- that was it. There was only one phone company. That's yeah, it. it There's one phone company in America that they created on their own. Yep. They didn't. They weren't licensed to be a monopoly, but they were just. I, I remember the commercial where, where MCI shows the commercial of two people talking on the phone, and they have the running total. And at the end of the total, it's like six or seven bucks for AT and T, which that's like thirty or forty bucks now. Correct. And then. Uh, MCI was at like three dollars. It was like literally almost double right. the the price, be, and and there was no reason for it. Right, it's the same phone lines. Right, right. So how is this possible? Because they they could do whatever they wanted, and then MCI came in and just completely separated. I mean, just completely revolutionized everything. They they invented resale. Right. They in, they invented the carrier market, the ability to 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 be able to lease lines that weren't being used one hundred percent by AT and T. MCI argued. They should have access to those lines that aren't being used to create competition and that that AT&T had to sell it to them at a reasonable price. And that's how that's how MCI got in the business. They were, you know, they were known more as being a uh, telephone company, uh, you know, with a, with, you know, a law firm that had an antenna on the roof. Right. That's really what they were noted for. They were that's how they got in the business. It was a legal way to break up AT&T is, is what is what MCI was. Which is good for the consumer. It was know? unbelievable for the consumer. We were, but you know, what's, what's funny is we've kind of gone all the way back around. There's not so many phone companies. I mean, when, when we're talking about who I was managing, there were probably a thousand, two thousand, three thousand phone companies in the United States when I was in the carrier market. Right. People never heard of them because it was like, the, like I said, the Matthew Cox or whatever, or the Walt Telecommunications. <laughs> like they were just popping up every day. It's like cryptocurrency. And we, yeah. Like, like everybody's like, got yeah, one. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, you'll, you'll be talking about those in episodes to come, I'm sure. Because yeah. um, that's the next big scam in right. fall is going to be just, is it, 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 it repeats itself. Telecom was, was, is a great example of, of how, it relates to housing. It relates to crypto. It really, you know, it, it repeated itself. Telecom was really the boom that, you know, tells you about like where, how scams begin and, and you know, how they start off really good and then they end up really poorly. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So at what point, like, I mean, you're managing all these, these different, um, uh, carriers, right? Yeah, so bill, billion a month, billion, billion dollars a month, and, billion and, dollars a and month. Every periodically, you're 
giving them a note or, you know, they're because I know I'm sure some of them are scamming. I, I mean, I know people, guys that are running like scams right now in mm-hmm. phone rooms and they'll buy the line. Sure. They, they buy this and then they set up a phone room. And they run for six or eight months or until questions get answered. Then they get shut down and they move somewhere else. And it's like. You know, it's like they have it down to a science or they think they always think you have it down to a science till you're doing 20 years. Uh, and what I want at what point did you realize things are going bad? Like, I mean, what was sure. that moment where you started going, OK, things are starting to come down? Well, I, I, you know, here's here's the thing that sort of masked a lot of the problems that we had is that 80 to 90 percent of our business was these giant companies paying their bill every single month. Right. So we're messing around with 20 percent of our revenue which is, but, but is mostly almost all of our profit. Um, so you can, it, it, there's still tons of money coming in, in, you know, into the, into the business. So we're just messing around with this small number of carriers over here where we're having to manipulate it. But when it starts to be really bad, as an example, is Caribbean telephone owing you 50 million bucks is a big number. Now right. it's like, wow, now it's out of control. Um, the other thing that makes it really difficult is that small telecom companies like, you know, Matthew Cox Telecom is going to make, can, can really hurt you really bad quick into the millions of dollars. And that, that's when we really knew that we were in trouble is that, that, um, we no longer have control. We had to start tightening our credit policy. We couldn't just let anybody on, which we had earlier, you know, just, Hey, what's your name, Matt, come on in, you know, you're on the network. So we had to tighten it. And now revenue in your new big profit area is shrinking because you're not bringing on new customers. Now I've, I've, I'm forced to deal with the problem. And um, the numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm traveling the country. It's very inefficient. I'm out there. I'm really physically, are you there? You know, you owe me money. Now I got to go to legal. You know, I mean, it's a whole process of going through it. And now you realize that this is, you know, really out of control. And... Um, so I lost my, my um, I guess the easiest way to explain is my, my boss left. I had a really good boss. He was a, a, a Naval Academy graduate, really good guy. And before we really started to have to really cook the books, he was kind of around and like, yeah, I don't know about some of this stuff that we're doing, but, you know, I'm getting out of here. Right. You know, he could see the wave. I don't want to be here when <laughs> the wave down. The wave's coming. So I get a new boss, you know, and, you know, hey, boss, I got to let you know some what's going on. Um, we have about eighty million dollars of customers that aren't going to pay us, and, and honestly, we're you know we're, here we are in October, November of the year, but it was about this time of the year, and I said, you know, in about eight weeks, we should ask for a bigger bad debt budget so that we can write all this off and then you know clean it up. And he says that's a great idea. I said, what's our bad debt budget for this year? I go, it's ten million, but and you're at eighty. We're ma- yeah, but we're managing that. Okay, we I've got this handled. You know, right. buy me eight weeks. And then we'll dump all this stuff. And um, he said, that's a good idea. And then, uh, you know, a few weeks later, he comes back to me and says, hey, they gave us our bad debt budget for the upcoming year. It's $15 million. And I'm thinking, well, <laughs> 15 is less than 80 right? Um, and, you know, there were a number of things that we talked about. Like, you know, can we tighten our credit policy? Can we improve our reporting? Can we hire a higher caliber of person to come in? Um, can we go visit these guys? I mean, there was all kinds of great ideas, right. but it was like, okay, but we're, that doesn't help me on the 80. Um, but he says, you know, can you help? And I go, I, of course I can help, you know, I can do what I'm doing. So I, I do that. I, I travel the country and I come back for the one week of the month at the end of the month. And I make the books look like what everybody wants, but I can tell you what, Matt, it was the, 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 Tide was coming in fast because 80 wasn't the number at the first of the year. It was more like 120 and 120 was getting ready to turn into 200. And I'm still, the numbers are, I've got them at 15. You know, that's what I'm, that's the budget that I make. And so it's going, it's going fast. And then, you know, that's when I have to, you know, talk about being in deep. Now for a while, you're like, I understand that everybody around me is doing this. Now they're somewhat condoning it and they don't really want to know what I'm doing. And now it's like, if they find out what the hell I'm doing, I mean, this is like a number that's going to get me escorted out of the building. Right. You know, this is like a large number that I'm kind of managing all by myself. And you're not the only person doing that. Like other people I are primarily, doing I got people working for me that are helping me do this. But 
each one individually doesn't know the totality of the problem. Right. Only I do. And, uh, you know, and that takes its toll. And I was just thinking. The thing and I'm like, the holy stress. shit, man. The you know, I got like was... guys over here is like, well, we got to hide this five million. I go, yeah, but this guy over here is wanting me to hide 20. Yeah. You know, so it Can was. Can we put it in the closet? No, I've got 40 million in the closet already. I mean, it, right. it starts to get really tough. And, and then that's when I said, you know, I, I got to find somebody to talk to. You know, right. I, you know, I get I. And uh, so I went outside the company and there was this guy named Harold, Harold Mann. And Harold was a couple of years older than me. I was like 32 at the time. He was 34. And he was rich. I mean, this guy had a big Mercedes. He he lived three months out of the year in Canada and the rest of the time in, you know, in Atlanta. And he just lived the life. And he had been a carrier on MCI's network. And I knew him. And he had since left. And, and, and I said, you know what? Maybe I should... I'm going to ask him for a job. I'm going to get the hell. I'm bailing. I'm yeah, yeah, pulling yeah. the ripcord, and um, and so I went to him and said that uh, I was honest with him. I said I, I told him the story that you and I have talked about here, and he was like, "Holy shit! Yeah, that's a those are big numbers. I mean, where are the auditors? Where's your boss? I mean, how the hell are you doing this?" And I just explained to him, I said, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing these notes. I'm doing the, you know, and he and was like. They're all, sem and the, my boss and my, the auditors are all semi-involved. In, in, they in, all understand. I'm not hiding this. This is, they this know, is kind, they kind of know what's going on. Yeah. yeah they're not they asking know. a lot of questions. Yeah. But. I'm meeting my numbers. Right. Right. But I don't know how much longer I can do it. And um, so he told me, like, you know, why don't you, let me think about it. And uh, he was a crafty guy. And. uh Met with him a few more times and, you know, I became more confident in telling him like, you know, this is exactly what I'm doing. He's like, wow. You know, he's like, you know, well, I got an idea. Why don't you stay where you're at? And I think that I can make these little companies good, solid companies. Number two, I think I can make them pay MCI. I was like, wow, that's good too. And number three, I can make me and you a hell of a lot of money. And I was like, wow, let's do, what's number three yeah. about all you got to do, Walt, is do what you continue to do. And um, and basically, it, it led to another fraud. You know, uh, now, what I'm about to, you know, talk about is not something that I would have gone into the company and said, wow, I could have made a lot of money, you know, stealing. You know, I mean, this was like an evolution of, of like, okay, it was a realization that like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm about to make some money. So what's wrong with that? Everybody else is making money right. and, and I'm making a lot of money for a lot of other people at my own risk. I'm taking this risk. I'm not, I don't, I don't have 200 million bucks. Um, so what, uh, what Harold and I devised is like put pressure on one of these customers, Walt, that you don't like. Pick one, anyone, pick one that they, that it's going to be difficult for that person to ever go get money. So I picked a company, it's called TNI. They were in the pornography business, 900 business. They owe two million bucks. Called up Mr. T and I and said, "You owe us two million bucks, or you're going to be disconnected." This guy immediately he's got to go find fucking two hundred million bucks somewhere, right? And um, wait, or two million, wait, two, two million, million, two okay, million, say, two, million two million, two million. I get it, when we get the numbers confused, two million bucks pretty quick, and he's got to do it within a couple of weeks, or he's going to be disconnected. And um, this guy's upset at me, you know, like, oh, you don't give me a chance, you know, come you, on. You, you knew it was coming. It's got, it's got to be coming. It really right. is my it's job, right? Mil, well, I'm, yeah, it's $2 million. You got the bill. You know what it's due. So, yeah. So he needs, so he's got to find, he, and he doesn't have the money. Look, Matt, these guys were going out. They, this guy had Atlanta Braves suite. He had Atlanta Falcon yeah, suite, Atlanta yeah. Hawk suite. He got a private airplane. He's, you know, he got all this. He, he, he's, he's got it going on. Right. But he doesn't have the two million bucks. No, I can tell you that. And all that other stuff. So into this guy's office after that phone call is made is uh, is uh, Harold, and Harold portrays himself as an angel investor, gives short term loans to companies like this, and this guy's going, "My God, your timing couldn't be better." He doesn't know there's any relationship. This guy says, "You can give me two million bucks." He goes, "Oh yeah, we specialize in short term loans. Tell me what's going on." So he explains it to him. Harold does a little due diligence, brings in like some accountants to look at the books. You know, the books are a mess. The guy had not paid taxes. You know, it's, it's just as a, and Harold says, well, I tell you what, I went to our, our, our loan committee and you're one of the, you're, you're a great candidate for us. We're going to take a chance with you. And he got, so well, you got to get me the money because I have to pay MCI. Right. And uh, Harold says, well, look, I've only known you a short period of time. Here's what we've been more comfortable with. We're going to wire the money directly to MCI. And once they receive it, they'll give you this, 
you know, they'll let you know the wire has been received and your account balance is zero. But in return, you're going to give me $250,000 down for putting this deal together just as a fee. Right. You're going to repay $10,000 a, a week for the next two years. And uh, you can give me 25% ownership of your company. And you're going to make payments to banks in the Grand Cayman Islands. And for whatever reason, you know, <laughs> the last one. Sound, that doesn't sound fishy at all. No, it doesn't at all. Unless you're desperate, right? And so this guy's desperate. He goes, that's a good deal for me. And uh, so there is no money ever wired. There is no money ever wired to MCI. No, I know. And, and then, uh, then you come in and you, I come and in you extend and his. Two, two million bucks. I can make it disappear. It and disappears. He has no idea. He thinks it was paid. He gets, and his phone stay on, right? His so phone stay on. He gets an, he gets an invoice. He goes like, Hey, just got a $2 million payment on it, which never was made. Right. The guy's paid 250,000. They came in islands, um, 10,000 bucks a week. Um, I'm actually meeting with Harold on the weekends to go over the finances of this small company to make sure that all the boyfriends and girlfriends are off payroll. The suites are sold. We're out of all that stuff. They do become a responsible pornography company. Um, but they're paying their bills on time. They're paying their taxes. All the things are brought up to speed. They're paying MCI on time, and they're paying me right. um, You know, to the Cayman Islands. So it was like a win-win all the way around, right? It's just like like I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know any of this, by the way. Just like I've seen the, I've seen the, the craziest right. thing, though, right? right. So you know, but you look back. I remember I spoke at um, at a Ivy League school, and uh, I told him about this, how this scam worked. And this one kid spoke up and said, "God, if I would have been you, Walt, I would have gone to that guy Caribbean Telephone and taken like a million bucks." off of the table to say, put it in the trash bag for me and I'll make sure your invoice goes to zero. Right. All right? We can keep this going for as long as you want. And I go, yeah, I guess I could have done that, but that's like stealing, <laughs> you know, the, but, but this, but if you do it this other way, it, it, it there's, did, it didn't feel like stealing. It, it felt very, it was a big rationalization to be able to do it. Yeah. And, and it, and, and then we find another customer and we do it and we do another customer and doing it. And then, you know, before we knew it, it was, a, it was almost 6 million bucks you know, that's in offshore accounts. We, the money never came through any entity in the U S right They're th These customers are paying it directly to bank accounts down there. This is such a better story than I thought. It is. <laughs> and you know, it's the worst part is Colby is that, you know, like I, I actually have a little bit, not that I didn't already respect you, but unfortunately for me now, it just actually went up and I know that's wrong. Like I should be like, Oh, that's horrible. How do you sleep at night? But to it me, was, I'm like, that's like genius. It was crazy. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's, you know, and I feel bad about that. It's horrible, yeah, it's, you know? yeah, it's good. Yeah. But we've moved on. We've moved on, you know, and, and, and I tell you in the way that it stopped basically was, um, I received a phone call, um, from another carrier who said, Hey, I was just at this show and I was talking to this other carrier and he was telling me about this guy named Harold who's doing these finances. I want to do that job. I want to do that gig too. Can you put me in touch with him? And I was like, yeah, this is now way out of control, right? Because now the victims are running to me. Right. I was going to say, and they're not even supposed to know that no. you are even, so the fact that they went to you to ask about him. Correct. And now there's a connection that, that's out there. I'm, I'm freaking out. Right. So, and then I said, Harold, we're not doing this anymore. And so we, we stopped, you know, and. I still have money in the Caymans. So you still got six million. Still got six million, but you know what? This isn't like a normal scam. It was more fun for Harold than it was for me. I got a full time job. Right. I mean, you know, I'm still doing billing and collections. I'm still chasing bad guys around that I can't work deals with. Harold's got all the money, and he's an entrepreneur, so he's running around. You know, he's on private jets and he's going back and forth to Caymans. He brings me back money every once in a while. I'll go with him, but I'm working my ass off. And um, but we stopped, and you know, some months go by. And my boss calls me. I'm out in Palm Springs, California, freaking chasing bad guys out there at a conference. And he called me and it was, um, I remember getting up early. It was like, geez, four or five a.m. in the morning out in California. And um, he said, well, I got a couple things to go over with you. One, we got, you know, we got to go to Chicago next week. Number two, you know, we got some requisitions. I want you to, you know, you got to hire some people. You know, you're falling behind. And I said, I know. He said, and finally, this guy, some uh, you know, woman in, in the audit group is, is bugging me about this journal voucher. Move some money around. Can you look into it? And I said, sure. Give me the name of the account. And he told me the name of the account. It was Christian News Network, which was one of the biggest fraud accounts that Harold and I had used in our scam. Right. And I was like, oh, my God, I've been caught. 
You know, it's just they a just matter of time. Yet. They just don't know it. So um, we talked for a moment more, and then I just out of nowhere told my boss, I said, you know what, I've quit. I'm not coming back to work. You know, because I, you know, I'm freaking out. I'm not even listening to anything after he says that. Has and WorldCom bought or merged? Not yet, not but yet. we were, we were supposed to be being bought within a few months from British Telecom, and that actually came out in the conversation. What do you, what do you mean you're quitting? We're getting ready to be purchased. Right. You know, I'm cashing out for well over a million dollars of stock options right. inside my company. You know, I'm thirty, you know, thirty two years old. So, you know, I was. I, I didn't need to steal anything, I mean, right. basically, you know, to, to, to have cashed out. But my, my stock options don't vest if I'm not with the company. I right. mean, so it, it's almost like... Yeah, you're just, shooting yourself in the foot. Like, well, that's just we, that's No just one would stupidity. do it. No, right, but, right. Yeah, right. You, got three, you're, you can't hang in there for three, four, four more months? Yeah. I mean, but come he on. He doesn't know what's He doesn't know. Yeah. So they begged me to come back to work. I got all these executives calling me. Hey, well, I'll come back to work. I don't, you know, we'll put you in a different position. I know you're under a lot of pressure. And then, you know, they start looking at my computers and stuff and they're like, holy shit, we got a, we got, we got a much bigger problem here. Can you walk, can you come in and internal investigations would like to talk to you? And I'm like, ah, you know what? I'm hiring an attorney. Um, it, and then it just went, it just went bad. I mean, then I have, I got banks suing me because I had, you know, I had, I had done some things with, uh, you know, with the, these loans with some of these carriers. It gets complex, but I had civil litigation going on. I mean, my life just sort of imploded. Man, you know, I got uh, target letter back. This is back in the old days. I mean, today FBI shows up, they got flak jackets on, you know, yeah, they're yeah. busting down doors. I mean, they sent you a note. Hey, do you have any Cayman documents? <laughs> No, right. we don't have any, right? Right. You know, that's a destruction of justice. But, you know, now they just don't even wait for that anymore. Yeah. They just come in and go get the documents. Um, but, it, you know, it took a while to kind of go through this. And, you know, you, you were asking earlier about, like, you know, did you know that what you were doing is wrong? Well, you know, clearly I know that I'm in trouble and you know, this isn't going to end well. I start finding out about federal sentencing guidelines. Um, and I'm like... What is the dollar amount? It was, it was, you know, it started off large... And then kept getting bigger, but it ended up being about six, a little over six and a half million. Oh, okay. So it didn't, it didn't get much more. They tried to make it more, but they, they couldn't. Right. Um, then there was just other things that it was so confusing as about like, well, what, what, who lost money here? Um, the carriers didn't really lose any money, right. you know? They didn't. They didn't lose anything. They got a pretty good deal. Like T and I, as an example, didn't have to pay the two million dollars. But they said, "Oh yeah, but they they ripped me off two hundred fifty thousand dollars." And they were, "Well, Wait, but you owe two million. You owe two million, right?" Um, MCI was really grossly marking up these, you know, these minutes, and um, so it became really confusing. How much money was it? Was it really worth? Right. Um, and so they just used the net number that we had received, which is a little over six million bucks. And oh, um, yeah, they could have gone way worse than that. You it could have like, like nowadays. Nowadays, we'll see the guidelines were different then. They were lower. Yeah. They, they were they were actually lower for dollar amount then. And yeah. um, and, I, and I and I cooperated. Right. You know, I, I pled guilty. I cooperated. Um, my buddy Harold decided I told him I was going to go. I said, look, we're we're toast. Yeah, we're done. I'm, I'm done. You know, so I'm going to turn myself in. Oh, you know, this is it's going to blow over. <laughs> Over. You're not going to blow no, over. It's not blow, especially in, it, when when. So it, at this point, had when you're going through this, is now the merger happening with with. MC well, so here's so here's what's happened. that's interesting about the merger because I want to bring it home to to those people and even you, like who know about MCI WorldCom. How did this happen? I'm going through all this. I'm pleading guilty. I pick up the Wall Street Journal, and in the Wall Street Journal, it says MCI's slash WorldCom's carrier division, resale division. The division that I was over is announcing a one-time write-off because of um, things that have, you know, some bad debt that they have. It was $687 million. So that was the beginning of the end. It was like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, the SEC wanted to get involved. Right before WorldCom bought, you know, was going to buy MCI, British Telecom was in the last stages of buying the company. I, I can't remember exact numbers, but it was like, I don't know, 50 billion. And then British Telecom said, you know, we've kind of looked at your books and we think we might want to go down to like 42 billion. Right. And MCI was pitching a fit and WorldCom comes in and says, well, we're not only pay you 50, we'll pay you 60. Uh, British Telecom was given $1 billion to walk away from the deal. 
so that WorldCom could buy MCI. And then they combined the two companies. And then that's when, you know, that's when all shit broke loose. And WorldCom had been on a rampage of buying companies, buying companies. And they were cooking the books on their yeah, side yeah. as well. Yeah, so. that was that was that was their their money make part of their money making scheme was just continue to acquire additional companies. Acquire right off as you go, try to, you know, bury some bodies as you right. go. And then a lot of people forget WorldCom had a bid to buy Sprint. And when they bought Sprint, the board of directors at Sprint approved the merger and the FCC stepped in and said, no, nah, that's you can't do it. Right. And after that, that's when oh, that's when all the bodies were found. Right. That's when all the, the accounting fraud was found. So it took it a little while to come out. But um, what was the total? Do you, do you know the, the number for the total uh, fraud? That yeah, they were, they were hit. Yeah, I think it was uh, twelve and a half billion. It was a large number, large number. And that only happened basically over a short period of time within like a year. I mean, that was the amount that they, you know, they had hidden, hidden, hidden. And then really a heavy transactions took place to hide, you know, I think I can't expenses and equity and all that. It, just, it was pretty complicated. Right. And so your, your, your loss, the loss that you had covered was in that loss. Yeah. But by that point, you're already... Are you, you, are you in prison yet? Or yeah, I'm, you, yeah, I'm, I'm in. I'm, so you're I'm, watching I'm, this on, I'm news, watching on the news. Matt, there is nothing that brings more joy to somebody in prison than seeing someone who's in more trouble than they are, right? Because I'm like, I'm, I'm already, I knew I'm in trouble. Here I am. But I said, these guys are going to jail. Yeah. How much They're, time did you get? Did you get? 41 months. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you go straight to a camp? Just Straight straight. to a camp. Okay. Yep. I went straight to a camp at Jessup, Georgia, and then Edgefield, South Carolina, because they had the RDAP program. So I went to, which I didn't even know about. It just started, you know, back then. So. Um, uh, I'm wondering. So it's, I I know that several of the people in WorldCom ended up getting small sentences, you know, 18 months, five years, three years. A lot of these guys got small. But then the the main... uh, the CEO, was it of... of uh, Bernie Ebers. Yeah, what do you get, 25 years? 25 years, yep. And he spent all of that time in prison and was released earlier this year and passed away, passed away. Yeah, within a cu- couple of months. Yeah, he was released on compassionate release and and then, you know, passed away. Yeah, so he had spent... And it, look, <clears throat> Bernie Ebers, um, just like the MCI's founders, a guy named Bill McGowan. Bill McGowan's... Uh, Smoker, drinker, entrepreneur, have right. fun, party, and um, that's what our culture was, and it fit very well with WorldCom. Uh, Bernie Ebers was a junior high school basketball coach and um, oh, had a right. uh, super super frugal, and, and, but then got super greedy as time went on. He did, but he had a his big breakthrough in telecom happened when a buddy of his had a hotel. And um, he said, hey, you know, it's a small hotel, I don't know, 50 rooms or something. He says, look, I'm going to I'm going to invent low uh, long distance discounters so that when they pick up their phone in their thing, they get like a lower rate than they would if they were to call from that hotel room across the country. Because that used to be a really expensive phone call. Right. So that's what he started. Long distance di- discounters is. Um, and then he got another hotel and another hotel and another hotel. And he had their long distance riding pretty much on MCI's network. Um, and then um, he turned that into a company called LDDS, and LDDS went to WorldCom, you know, became WorldCom, and he had these visions of buying AT&T one day. Um, but it was a success story. He was, a, you know, a crazy entrepreneur, and, you know, he did he yeah. did well. I was going to say, it's, it's, I, I mean, it's funny because it, the 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 – like I watched a, a documentary on him, how like he was so like just cheap the whole way through, right? And then towards the end, it just got insane. Like he was blowing tons of money on yachts and houses and j- jets, and it was like timber. What, what happened? Thousands and thousands of acres, and most of his. You know, what was interesting is that like a lot of his um, his wealth, you know, the, the things that he enjoyed in life were debt, debt related to, that were collateralized by his stock by price stock, okay right. so when the stock price fell he really has nothing left you know he you know they they just took everything from him i mean he really he held on to his stock you know he was he wrote his stock to the end and you know lost considerable amount of his wealth um there was along with everybody else so um he was a very unique guy but you're right he had all these stories about being frugal about 
you know, the amount of coffee yeah, that stop, they were. Let, stop, stop paying for any of the Everybody's got to buy their own coffee. Right. You know, all that kind of stuff. He was just spent $40 million on a new yacht. Yeah. Like, what, what, what are you doing? It was, it was, yeah, it was marketing. He thought of it as marketing. You know, I mean, I, think, I, I don't know. You know he, he was an interesting character and he was, you know, cowboy boots. Yeah, just a, a, a nice. Shtick, right? It's, it was it was a good shtick. He was a nice guy. He'd buy you a drink. He would, he yeah. would talk to you. He could talk about anything. I it's mean, like like uh, Sarah Palin. Sell, you know, first thing she does is sell the sell the the, the jet or the 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 state owned jet. You know, like yeah. I, I, you know, it's it it's great. It makes for a great sound bite. You know, what yeah. I'm saying. But what's really happening behind the scenes? Yeah. Is, yeah. is something completely different. No, no, and that's that was very true of Worldcom. And there was you know, there were really bright people that you know got involved and. A lot of the reasons, you know, that you, you, I know you guys talk about a lot of, you know, true crime and, but, but basically the way the federal system is, if you can turn on somebody, you're going to get a much lesser sentence, significantly less than the person you turn on. And to, to nab a CEO is like the ultimate prize right. for Justice Department. I mean, that was the ultimate. And even their C, CFO, Scott Sullivan, um, he, um, I think he got five years, significant sentence, but you know, for a twelve billion dollar, yeah, that's not that's, not that much. So you know, I, I it's funny too because I go back and forth on that. Like sometimes I think you know it's you know, you know it was a hundred million dollars. Like like that guy should have got twenty years. But then I I go back and forth and then I think, you know, he didn't he didn't kill anybody. You know what I'm saying? It was right. he, he cooked the book. He changed some numbers around. Like so I, I kind of it's like. Okay, so you're going to give a rapist ten years. You can't give this guy twenty. Sure. You see what I'm saying? So it's 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 the the sentencing guidelines of the people that come up with them. I mean, it, it's it, it's a balancing act. Like it, it's never it's never going to be fair to everybody. So mm-hmm. I every time I think about that, I, I I'll, I'll I'll think you know this guy owes three hundred million dollars and he got five years. That's ridiculous. But then I think yeah, but. He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't physically right. harm anybody. You know, right. he cooked the books and nobody lost money. It was, it was a bank loan. You know, the other thing I'll add to that, and this is something I've thought about, too, is where are the regulators in this business? We, you know, there are, there are a lot of people with oversight who didn't get prosecuted. I mean, let's go like to like Bernie um, Madoff. What about Bernie Madoff is a great example. You know, Bernie Madoff, they said, what is it, 50 billion? All right. I'm going to give Bernie a billion. Right. The other 49 billion should be on the SEC because yeah. where in the hell are they? Yeah. Right. And, 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 and all he this. wasn't he was looked at several times like they never followed up. They never Correct. did their due diligence. Like he said, oh, here are the transactions. They never looked into Where's it. that guy. Where's where are those people that, that, that you yeah. know, failed to do oversight? And I'm not, I'm not justifying what he did, but I'm just saying, look, after a while, if you're what's the purpose of having regulators and oversight? Right. You know, and and there's a lot of pressure on these businesses and they need to play by the rules. And when they step out of line, let's whack them early. So that instead you, of later, you know, what's funny about that. Like, I, I actually just did an interview in. um in uh, Oklahoma City, with a, a, a an elected an elected official o- over the uh, public records right system there, and I was asking him, I'm like, yeah, well, if I provide you with a document, like you like, you're going to record it. He's like, yeah, we have to record it. I said, right, I understand, but I said, if it if it does, what if it doesn't look right? And he's like, well, we have to record it no matter what. I said, so if I write it in green crayon, right, you have to record it. And he went. We have to record. I said, yeah, but you could look at, like, why don't you call? You can call. And he goes, no, no, by law, we're not allowed to call. Right. So, so I right. come up with a fake satisfaction of mortgage for a $300,000, $300,000 mortgage. I have a fake satisfaction as long as it, he goes, as long as it has this notary stamp, the OR book and page number match up, and I can match it up. He said, and it's got, an, he said, and you paid the fee? He said, we record it. We cannot call. He said, even if someone's saying this is fraud, he goes, no, nope, can't call. Wow. He's, we're not, he's legally, we're not allowed to call. He's like, that's why this fraud happens. And I, I can imagine the SEC has those, those same types of, of constrict to a degree. Sometimes people, you know, they'll say, well, you should have this, you should have that. But sometimes it's so regulated right. that they can't. I remember I, I talked to the FBI one time and I was like, why don't you go into brokers and give them a scenario where they have to make the loan go through, they have to commit. Fraud has to be involved. Like I can come up with like five scenarios where you go in and say this and this and this, there's no way to make that loan happen unless fraud's involved. And they said, well, we would, that would be us interfering with commerce. (laughs) And I went, and? And she said, we're not allowed to interfere with commerce. And I went, let it go down. I said, Mm -hmm. I said, so you have to let it happen and then come in. She goes, exactly. I go, so you, so I, I said, well, I go like, that's good to know for me. Yeah. I know that if we actually schedule a closing, that means that nobody, there was no, there was no, nobody, I wasn't being set up. 
Mm. If there's a closing schedule, I get there and I sign. Like I know that the FBI wasn't right. involved because they they wouldn't be allowed right. to be involved in right. that transaction. I mean, it's those kinds of things that you go. This is this is insane. Like if you know those things, then you can you can run rampant. Right. Um, right. So okay. So I, back to I will go sorry, back to my story sorry. real quick though. That's right. That, that was good. But I, I did. You know, Harold ended up getting um, five years. Um, Canadian citizen, so he was had to go to a low. And he was deported and hadn't heard from him since. Um, there's a couple of other guys that were involved directly in, in mine, and they they did. Uh, I think one guy got five, another guy got five years. He was an attorney, you know, you get the enhancement for the attorney, and then yeah. another guy did, you know, eighteen months. So yeah, I got the enhancement for being a mortgage broker. Yeah, you're you're, you're, mortgage, you're, you're, you're in a you position of response. But right? anytime you're in a white collar crime, yeah. sophisticated, sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was love uh, uh, using. You know, now they'll they'll say using a specialty device in furtherance of your crime, which means and it's like, what was the specialty device? Use the computer. Yeah, it's a cell phone. Who doesn't use a cell phone? Like what? Yeah, um, exactly. So so uh, okay, but you went to prison. You yep. got out and then you started doing, you start, I know you started consulting and you sure. started doing, uh, like I've seen you online where you're doing the speeches sure. or, in fr- or, key- or keynote speeches in front yep. of uh, um, universities and, and yep. MBA programs. And yep. the oddest way I got into that, Matt, I was, uh, I was walking the track um, in Edgefield, South Carolina. And the warden comes up to me and says, Hey, the FBI wants to talk to you. And we've, you know, like Monday, he says, you know, we got a conference room on Wednesday. You just go in there and, you know, talk to them. And I was like, about what? Right. I don't know. They want to talk to you. And, you know, that's a holy shit moment, right? Yeah, yeah. He's like, you know, why do, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to talk to <laughs> I'm already in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm, I, in I, I'm done. I'm getting ready. To, I'm, I'm like getting forgot, out of here. They forgot to charge you with this. I got like <laughs> six or seven months to go. I mean, it's like, what? Are, and uh, it was uh, Agent uh, Ray Kyle um, who had worked on my case. And he said, hey. Um, I got an opportunity for you. I mean, do we want to train some FBI agents and U.S. attorneys on the Enron and WorldCom task force? And I was like, well, how the hell am I going to do that? And he said, well, they want me to give a presentation, but I really don't like speaking in front of people. So can you do it? And he says, I'll just be up there with you. I might, you know, I'm just going to introduce you and you can tell them what you did. Um, and, uh, and I pretty much, told him the same story that I told you today. Right. And um, except I did it as an incarcerated inmate in front of 300 U.S. attorneys and FBI agents. So in my were, first it, public, I was incarcerated. They, I, they came and got you and moved you? Came and got me and they looked, not moved me. I, they put me on an airplane and nice. uh, took me to Marina Del Rey, nice. um, California for three days. And uh, the That's FBI, it was it was just well received. Nobody had ever done it before except for one other guy, and his name is Frank Abagnale. I was just going to say that's like Frank. That's some Frank Abagnale stuff. So the the handler for for Frank was there, and he said, "Hey, Frank's getting ready to have this movie made about him, and he's getting older. Would you come to the FBI Academy?" And and I was like, "Wow, you know, this yeah. is just crazy." And so I. They got me speaking events. The FBI worked on getting me speaking events after Enron and WorldCom collapsed. Business schools were looking for ethics teachers and ethics, you know, and, you know, I had the FBI on my resume. Yeah. And, um, you know, spoke probably now to over 100 schools. I did new hire training for KPMG, new hire auditors for 17 years. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it just it just became a way to you know, try to get back, you know, what am I going to do, you know, when I get back yeah, yeah. out? And, uh, and, and, uh, the other thing is, Matt, is I enjoy it. I mean, it's been a lot of fun. I meet interesting people. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, about 11 years ago, I was approached by Neil Weinberg, who co-wrote the book Stolen Without a Gun with me. And he said, Hey, would you start writing for Forbes, a blog? And, uh, been doing that for over 11 years. And, uh, and then I, I started writing for NYU Law, um, you get on white collar crime right. and, and I, you know, it's just, it, it, these stories are fascinating. I mean, the work that you're doing is amazing. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that that's, you know, people want, people can learn from these. I mean, we can, you can look at a crime like the one that I committed or the one that you were involved in and you can, you know, you can sort of get a, uh, wow, that's crazy. You know, but I think there's also a, a, a deterrent in that too, by telling people like, Hey, you know what, there's, 
it never works out. It's always yeah. a bad ending. You know, yeah. I mean, you, you, you're never going to be able to interview the white collar guy who said, man, I stole 15 million bucks and I got away with it. Yeah. Right. So unless he was the CEO of a bank somewhere, you know, maybe those guys get yeah, away. And kept it. Uh, and kept it. Yeah. And, and committed another fraud by keeping right. the money. So, those, those stories just don't exist. Right. Well, I was, you know, it's funny because being in prison, like you, you were you're like, OK, so when we initially I was locked up when we first uh, sure. communicated with each other. Yeah. So I remember. I don't know. How the hell did you find me? I don't even. OK, so I think it was Marcus Shrink. You'd written a letter to Marcus Shrinker. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and he showed me the letter and I had somebody else had also had a letter from you or, or had also. I think I was looking for material at the time. That's right. what I was. I was starting right. to write guys in prison. I could look them up. I could look them up on BOP. I'd find out about there. You're exactly right. I write remember doing it. I was like, hey, who are you? I'm on Core Links. I'd like to communicate with you and then I can write about your story. Right. Yeah, so exactly. We started communicating. And I remember and when you kind of explained what you did, I remember thinking, Maybe I could do that, and you were like, "You could definitely do this." You know, right? Get you on it. You could start uh, talk, being a keynote speaker, blah, blah blah. And we talked about it, and I remember that there were so many guys in prison that have done frauds that are fascinating, and everybody I met, like with the exception of you, everybody I met that was in that I would consider a con man that was in prison, mm -hmm. were all actively trying to figure out how do I get out and bury this? Right. Like, how do I hide from this? And right. I, I was the only one that was saying, no, I don't, I'm not going to hide from this. Like, like I, I don't want to spend the rest of my life lying. Like lying is what got me here. Right. So I'm not thinking that by continuing that behavior, my life's going to turn around and I need to turn, I need this to turn around. Right. And you were the only person that had like was sitting there. And I was looking at, it, I was like, this isn't Frank Abagnale, who's kind of like it, it's like the crim de la crum of of, of sure. a criminal, like like thinking, oh, that could be me, because I don't, because I was thinking that's impossible. Like he's gonna have a movie, he's got, or he's got a movie, he's got all this stuff. But I'm like, the real people that I can actually talk to and connect with, like this guy's writing me letters. Right. This guy's doing. This guy didn't run from this. This guy said, look, right. this is what I did, and I screwed up, and, and here's what I'm doing now, and, and deal with it. Right. And I thought, this is what I want to be. This is the guy that I want to emulate. You know, so, so that's when I started thinking along. I was already writing stories. Yeah, you were, you were and they were right. good stories. You were sending me a lot of stuff, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I can't, I, you know, but, I, but you're handcuffed in prison. I mean, you really are. You're, I, you're, you're, I mean, it's yeah. like there's just nothing that you can do, and you're trying to, and, it, and for somebody to... Really, you you need an agent yeah. that comes out yeah. there you need and an advocate. Can, can, you were the only person that was saying you can do this. Yeah, everybody else is saying get a job working. This at, format yeah. that you're doing now didn't even exist when we started writing. The, the right? la, yeah, the last couple you know? of years when I got out, I, people started coming. When they saw me writing, they started coming to me with with stories about pot, true crime podcasts, and I was like, well, I don't even know what a, what is a podcast. Like the word did, podcast sure. didn't exist. Right, people don't even realize that podcast is a made up word which is combined from what it's like um there's two different things it's it's a it's a oh a, like a broadcast and pod or whatever like it's a portion of a broadcast like yeah. it, it's a made up word that developed while I was in prison right. it didn't even exist before I was in prison right. so all of these things and you were the, like I said you were the only person that was saying this is what you can do and this is what I am doing and when you get out, contact me. Yep. I remember I tried to get you to come into the prison and yep. you, you sent your stuff in. But in it, you know what happened? I think I said that I wrote for Forbes, right? I wrote for Forbes. And because of that, my counselor was so brain dead that he was like, <laughs> he was like, he, he's, um, he's a reporter. Yeah. And I went, yeah, I, I, I know his counselor, Carrie. And I go, I know, Carrie, I know he's a reporter, but he's not coming to see me as a reporter. He's coming to see me because we're thinking about writing an ethics and fraud course. And he teaches, he, he, he sp speaks at MBA programs around the country and I could do this. He's saying I can do this. And he's like, um, he's a reporter. <laughs> you know, I, I understand that. I said, Carrie, I said, listen, if my mother was a reporter, would she would still be able to come <laughs> see me? Right. And he goes, all reporters have to go through the public information officer. And I was like, no, I, and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, you're the perfect BOP employee. Yeah, like, you, are. <laughs> you don't get any better. Right, than and you. I just was like, 
yeah, okay, we're good. Thank yeah, you. Like, yeah. I'm never getting through to this guy. No. Never. No. And so you never, you, you never Yeah, I think I do. I do remember. I think you may have told me, said, can you submit another one that doesn't say Forbes on it? Right, right. And, I, <laughs> and we, yeah, that I think, time was probably too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a, there was a, I needed a whole new counselor to be involved. And this guy's my counselor. He gets all this stuff. Like, it was, it was never going to work after that. Um, yeah, he was, God, there's just so bad. No, that's so good. Bad. No, but this is good. You know, they, they, you know, they, they, I think these sorts of platforms, being able to tell stories, you know, I think that um, places like American Greed uh, on CNBC is an example. Don't do justice to a lot of the things. You, yeah. Well, you they rarely, have to villainize you. Right. And, you, and they're rarely talking to the person who perpetrated the crime. Very rarely. They're talking to like all the investing. Oh, yeah, I busted his ass. And, you yeah. know, and all the you know, and so you get this one side of the story. You don't really get, you know, the other, you know. You know what what happened? You know, I, hell, I was there. You were there. You right. know what? And, and there's no, we have nothing to gain by saying that something else happened that didn't happen. I mean, I find defendants in cases much more believable than the authorities. Yeah. Because the authorities rarely understand exactly what the guy did, and they just got to make up a story, and it's just like this is our narrative. And and you he, always have to be a, an extreme villain. Correct. Like, like my crime, they had they they went they actually in the they actually went with like the whole he preyed on single mothers and it's like preyed on listen in that period of time i dated five women three of them had children why don't you talk to the other two you yeah, know like right. well because that doesn't we're, we're going with the you you preyed on single mothers like right. well, why because that was a that was a big thing then right How right protect single mothers and this guy's a horrible but well, what do you talk like it's you right. know what I'm they, they they have to come up with something to make you a horrible horrible individual and yeah. it was like, and that's one of the thing, one of many things they they grabbed on. It's like, I just did an interview in um, Amsterdam for a documentary, and they were like, "Well, we, we need to talk to some of your victims." And I said, "Oh, pfft. I said, you know, Bank of America still open. Um, you can talk to." So I start naming off banks, and they're like, "Well, we were thinking, you know, like individuals." And I went, "Well, there's there's four individuals in my case that lost money. Yeah, N- none of them that I stole from directly, but they did as a result of my crime. They ended up owing money." And I said, "So." Now you've got over 55 banks. So you want to come up with a, a segment that a segment of that victim list that represents my, uh, um, the victims in my crime. I said, then you should be talking to banks. Right. But that doesn't sell. No. They want someone to get on there and say, oh, I lost $9,000. Right. And yep. You know, no, you're right. You're right. You know, it's just, it's just, but, that, yeah. but that's what that's the beauty about this format. I mean, you're you're you know, I think you're cutting down to like, you know, just tell us what happened. Yeah. You know, it makes it it's easier to understand, too, than the other stuff, I think, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and um, so, I mean, I I, I I I do think that more of these stories need to get out there. I, I was talking to somebody at a, at a business school and I said, you guys ought to stop teaching ethics here to these students and start teaching federal sentencing guidelines. I said that the whole time. It's terrifying. No one's ever even heard of them before. I never heard of them. You know, when they started looking at points and all these, you're like, wow, that's, I mean, wire fraud's that. I don't have to actually receive the money in order to get punished for it. I mean, like insider trading is a great example. If I work inside of a, a Fortune 500 company and I handed you 10 grand, or you paid me 10 grand to go trade on stock because I'm going to give you, oh, we're getting ready to, you know, this other company's getting ready to merge with us and buy us, you know, and I, you, so you're going to give me some money for that. You gave me 10 grand and then you went out and traded on it and you made 10 million. I'm on the hook for 10 million. Yeah. I got 10 grand. I mean, a lot of people, that's your guideline, your guideline sentence for, you know, somebody like, I'm just giving you some information. I didn't make that much money. Yeah. They have no idea. They have no idea. Like, like crazy. I know a guy that got 30 years because he sold heroin to this guy this guy sold the heroin to somebody else that person od'd he got charged with you know he got charged with the murder and he got 30 years yeah you know and it's murder it's like oh no it's an accidental overdose nope murder we're charging you with uh you know yeah. with a, no a it's, death and a you know it's like well i didn't sell it to, to that person serious serious time yeah you know serious and there's there's segues to say okay i kind of get that but and and that's okay if everybody understood that that's what the game is, right? right? This is how it works. You would say, hey, better not do heroin because if somebody, you deal in that and somebody dies, the risk is I could go away for a long period of time, you know? I got the same thing. I, I know another guy named Brandon in prison who got like 20, 20 or 25 years. Same thing. He was a bouncer at a club. Some girl had, was taking Oxy and she said, look, I, 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 she asked him, do you know anybody that sells Oxy? And he said, well, I know a guy that sells like heroin. He might have Oxy. She goes, what's his number? Gave her the number. 
two weeks later, she died because that guy gave her heroin. You're in. And you, that's it. You're you just involved. got charged with your murder. You're a murderer now. You're, you're like, involved. I gave her a name. Mm-hmm. I didn't make a dime. I, you know, it's, it's, they're young. They're young. They were all young, early 20s. And, you know, he but, thought he was, he, he literally thought I, he was doing someone a favor. Yeah. No. So yeah. it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Same as in white collar crime. There's all these different segues, play, play, you know, ways to get in trouble that you didn't envision uh, in a bad spot. Most of the time you should walk away, but it's really. Oh, now? Now hard. somebody says, hey, man, do you, can you give me a phone number? No. No, but, no, no, but uh, can you talk to me? Like, you, I'm not asking you to do anything. I get on Messenger all the time, like, bro. I actually did a whole video on it. It was like, I actually had a guy fly down from New York one time who had basically tried to be like friends with me. Like he was a fan and we were friends. And then he actually, six months this went on, then he flew down, met me at a coffee shop and tried to convince me to, te- to teach him how to commit a uh, bank fraud. And I was like, <laughs> I said, do you understand I'm already on the indictment? <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not asking you to, I won't say nothing. First of all, you will, but let's assume you didn't. It doesn't matter. My phone, my phone number is in your phone. Right. Our messages are on the phone. Now you have, we've ma- been making phone calls now that you've flown here. Right. Like nobody's going to believe that you flew here and I didn't help you. Right. Right. I said, I'm all re- They won't even question me. They'll just put me down on the indictment. Right. I'll, one day they'll show up and arrest me. I said, it won't matter. I said, I can't get on. The people don't realize that I can't now go to trial because I can't get on the stand. Right. Because they'll say, Mr. Cox, you've been convicted of fraud a few times before, haven't you? That's it. I'm done. Yeah. Not credible. Right. I said, I'll basically have to walk in and just say, look, man, just like, what's the best deal I can get? (laughs) Yeah. Well, do, do you feel you did anything? No, I don't feel I did anything, but I got to take a deal. So yeah, w- yeah. What, how, much how do we do this? Do? Right. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. But yeah, definitely the, the, the guidelines would be scare that crap yeah. out of people. Yeah, it's good. They're good to know. Good to know. You should know that well, you should know what the um, what the perils are of uh, not following the rules. Right. So I, I mean, I think do you have anything else you want to say? I no, think that's a good. great. That's okay. good. Um, all right. So this one. Yeah. All right. It's so funny because I'll say a yeah. point. I'll say this in the thing. I'll yeah. be like this one. Like we don't cut out anything. Um, okay. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Uh, this was Walt Pavlo. Uh, I appreciate you watching. If you like the video, do me a favor. Subscribe. Hit the uh, um, hit the thumb hit the thumbs up button. Hit the bell to be notified. Leave a comment for the algorithm. I appreciate it. And make sure you share the video as many times as possible. And don't feel uh, don't don't be shy about watching it th- three or four times. And and all the all the ads. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I'll see you.